give thanks. Then you shall be radiant in what you see, 
your heart shall throb and overflow, for the riches of the sea shall be emptied out before you. The wealth of nations shall be brought to you. Caravans of camels shall fill you. Dromedaries from Midian and Ephah, all from Sheba shall come, bearing gold and frankincense, and proclaiming the praises of the Lord. This is the word of God. The responsorial psalm is, Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. O God, with your judgment endow the ruler, and with your justice the ruler's son, who shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. Justice shall flower in his days, and profound peace, till the moon be no more. May he rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall offer gifts. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring tribute. All kings shall pay him homage. All nations shall serve him. Lord, every nation on earth. For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. The second reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for your benefit. Namely, that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. It was not made known to people in other generations, and it, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and co-partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The word of God. Herod. 
They departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you're a baby boomer or a millennial. 
So we have an understanding, a limited understanding of location and time, but we pretty much keep that to what's near the bias. When you look at an astrological chart, you're looking at how the planets and the stars and the whole universe is impacting your birth and saying that you also have an impact on the whole universe. So we're looking at a much bigger perspective. So when we look at the scripture today, the three, or actually it doesn't say three, the magi, the wise men, are people who have studied the stars. For generations, they have been predicting that this star will appear that will tell them that this great ruler is born. So they've been watching the skies for that. And sure enough, it does appear and they go to see Jesus, who is influenced, of course, not just by the Lord of Bethlehem, but by the whole universe, because this is God's child. It's not Bethlehem's child. It's God's child. And this child coming is going to affect everything in motion, everything that there is. In our um, country, we, we do have an understanding of destiny. Some of us are destined to have a certain role in life or a certain vocation in life, and that's also true in India. They talk about it as karma, as the fulfillment of your life. And the wonderful thing about that understanding that helps us to see that we have a purpose in life that's beyond our own capabilities or talents. And that our job is to fulfill that destiny, not to create it. We don't have to sit down at age 21 and think my destiny in life is ta-da, this. Right? But rather, that God does have a mission and a plan for us. And our job is really to just day by day fulfill that, what that is. There's a famous football uh, coach from Notre Dame, Lou Holtz. Many of you would be familiar with him. And he said about himself, he said, I used to pray that God would make me a great athlete. And God never did. He said, but he did put me in the coaching profession where I've experienced 45 years of being involved in great games and having a positive influence on other people's lives. He said, had I been a great athlete, I probably never would have been a coach. But I know that God does answer your prayers. It's just not always in the ways you would expect. God knows what's best for us, though, so there's no need to worry when things don't go how we originally wanted them to go. We just have to be willing to make changes and go a different route sometimes. So Lou Holtz there talking about in his area of football, the idea of destiny, that he really had a mission in life to be a coach. And even though he thought it might be something different, God had a plan for his life. And his job was really to discover what that plan was. When we discover that plan, we call it a vocation. A vocation is different than a career. When you go out to college, you might be thinking in terms of a career, or job opportunities, or room for advancement, benefits that you'll get. But a person does not choose a vocation. A vocation is a calling. It comes to us externally, from God, from circumstances in life, from who we are created to be. People generally feel that they don't have a choice in the matter. I think Lou Holtz wanted to be an athlete, but his vocation was to be a coach. But they do feel that their life isn't fulfilled until they follow that vocation. You can be called to your vocation in many different ways. Some people have a talent that just can simply not be ignored. My oldest son, Matt, is a musician. I tried for a lot of years to be interested in some, him in something that I thought would produce a better financial benefit than being a musician. <laughs> but from age eight, he was a musician through and through. He sees everything in terms of music. That's who he is, and he's quite successful in that because it's who he's called to be. I know in our parish we have artists who, they're simply called to paint. You can take them and put them somewhere without anything to color with and they would make it out of the dirt. They just have to paint. I know an auto mechanic who it's in him to be an auto mechanic and never has been since he was a little boy. That's who he is. And so on and so on. We all have things in our life or know people that that's, that's just who they are and it's who they have to be. 
Some of us are called to our vocation by life calling us to that, by experiencing something to us that becomes so important to us that we can't do anything else. I think of a famous woman, Frances Perkins. Frances, when she was 31 years old, uh, it was 1911, she was at a tea party in Lower Manhattan with some other women, and they heard a huge commotion outside. And right next to Washington Square Park, there was a clothing factory, the Triangle Shirtwaist Clothing Factory. And so they ran out to see what was happening, and the building was ablaze. The eighth, ninth, and tenth floors were totally on fire. And they saw bundles of clothing being dropped out the windows. But as they looked closer, they realized that it was, they were women jumping from the fire to their death below rather than being burned alive. She saw one man help several women jump out the window, and then he took a woman, a woman and embraced her in his arms, kissed her goodbye, dropped her down, and then he himself followed after her. 147 women and children and a few men died that day. Frances never forgot the images that she saw that day. She already had a, a concern for the poor, and she knew that the city of Manhattan knew very well the terrible working conditions that the women and children experienced in those clothing factories, but they had looked the other way and done nothing about it. She devoted the rest of her life to workers' rights, and especially women's rights. She later became the first woman in a cabinet post under uh, Delano Roosevelt. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, she was his labor secretary, at his insistence. She was central to writing the New Deal. She wrote the legislation for Social Security, the legislation for the first minimum wage law, the first overtime law. She got through legislation reducing children and women's working hours to 57 hours. Later, it was reduced to 40. She wrote the first legislation against child labor and the first legislation for unemployment insurance. She was a woman with a vocation. There was no stopping her. There was nothing else that she could do except focus on that. There are many people who had vocations, some called by external circumstances, some called by faith. In 1896, Albert Schweitzer came upon a biblical passage Whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall save it. He said he knew at the moment he read those words that he was called to give up his very successful musical career and go into medicine. He became a doctor and went into the jungles of Africa where he did practice medicine. He also said, though, anyone who proposes to do good must not expect people to roll the stones out of their way. <laughs> and in fact, there will be more stones that accumulate and more obstacles. As I was preparing this homily yesterday, I read a little article in the paper about Sister Grace Miller, who runs the House of Mercy here in Rochester. House of Mercy is the home for the homeless who have no other option. She takes everybody in her home. And the said in the article that in September, when Mother Teresa was canonized, that Sister Grace Miller in the House of Mercy was mentioned uh, in broadcasts around the world as a heroic effort and as changing things here in Rochester. But she said a few weeks later, a young woman was wandering the streets of Rochester with her six-year-old son, homeless, and nowhere to go. So even though she made international news, the work she had still needed to be done. The obstacles were still there. The woman and her son found her way to the House of Mercy, and Sister Grace Miller made up two beds on the floor of her office. So when we follow our vocation, we don't necessarily sign up for an easy life or a happier life. It doesn't necessarily mean that our children will turn out perfectly or we'll spend the summers at Disney World or even have enough money to pay all our bills. But what it does mean is that that inner call within us will be expressed in the life that we lead. We need to have a willingness to face the struggle that comes. 
We need a willingness to mold ourselves for the task at hand, to learn new skills and meet new people. And most importantly, we need a willingness to be led. Because the direction that we take in following a vocation does not come from our own thinking. It comes from something much greater. It comes from God's guidance for us. In today's scripture, the players of the story are willing to be led. The Magi come, following a star, and also listening to a dream that tells them not to go back to King Herod, but rather to take a different route home. Joseph and Mary are also led. They come to Bethlehem to pay their taxes, probably fully expecting to turn around and go back to Nazareth, where they come from. But rather, they are led on as refugees to Egypt to avoid the cruel dictate of King Herod, who will slaughter all the baby boys looking for this potential threat to his kingdom. In both cases, the Magi and Joseph and Mary, they don't know what's going to happen next. They don't know what's going to be there. They don't know the obstacles that they're going to be. But they trust that God will lead them, will take them where they are meant to be. Each of us is also being led. But like Joseph and Mary, we have a free choice to listen to that voice of God within us or to ignore it. Remarkably, our choice does not change the love that God has for us. God does not love us more or less because we listen and are led. But it does, however, change the mission of our lives and the potential happiness and well-being of others. I sometimes think that it is the simplest members of our community that are the very best at being led. I think of for myself of my own little spiritual director, my grandson, who has an amazing ability to simply be led by God. Recently, his mom and dad had, are you willing to give it a try? Are you willing to be led by God and be a means for God's love in the world? To show genuine affection, loving one another deeply from your heart. To purify your own soul by your obedience to the truth of who you are called to be. To set your faith and hope on God. God has a star for you to follow. God is the star. And like Joseph and Mary and the Magi, we are the people who follow the star. All we need is a willingness to be led.
safe on the shooter. Let's pray for peace in the Middle East, especially in Aleppo. For all the refugees, for everybody who's sick, for people in the hospital, for people suffering from mental illness and depression, addiction, people in jail, people in nursing homes. Who is on your mind today that you'd like to pray for? Please mention their names. Okay. Now as we lift these gifts, we just invite you to give your heart to God just the way it is today. You don't have to change anything. Whatever is making you happy, whatever is causing you pain, whatever you're worried about today, just give it to God and trust. Blessed are you, loving God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread and wine to offer to you, which the earth has given and human hands prepared. They will become our spiritual food and drink. Blessed be God. May God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to our loving God. Let's give God thanks and praise. It's always great to thank you, God. Today we want to thank you for the star, for you, for your guidance, for all the ways that you've led us through life, through the good times and the hard times. Thank you for trusting us that, that we would be willing to follow you. And so we praise you and honor you with all the saints in heaven as we sing this prayer.
many different places, different religions, different backgrounds. Here we are at your table. But we know that you love all of us the same, no matter what. Thank you for sending Jesus here to show us the love of God. He treated everybody with compassion, no matter who they were, even his enemies. When people were hungry, he fed them, no matter what group they belonged to. When they were sick, he healed them, regardless of what language they spoke. He never made judgments, never condemned anybody. When he was arrested, he didn't fight back because he was nonviolent and had no revenge. He forgave everybody before he died. Then he rose from the dead and gave us life that was on forever. So we give you this life of bread and the saving cup today in memory of those acts of love. And we just thank you for this moment right now. Just standing in your presence with all these beautiful people in this holy place one more time. We say a prayer for our churches. Help us to be beacons of hope for people that are lost and hurting and mistreated. Plus the Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, people of native religions, people with no religion. May we love each other better and heal our world together. Bless all those who have died. We especially remember Allison Bailey's father, for Gary Bagley's sister. Nelson Leanhouse lost his twin brother, Norman, yesterday. For all the victims of uh, Fort Lauderdale, for all the people that die on our streets, and all the people we miss. And God, one day when we die, save us a place with Mary and Joseph, and prophets, and all the people that have done your will. We will praise you in union with them, and we will give you the glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. For it is through him, with him, him in him, in the unity, unity of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. All the glory and honor is yours, Holy God, God, forever and ever.
peace and love of Jesus be with each one of you. And also with you. Thank you. Let's share Christ's peace and love with each other. Peace,
Brian Marlowe, Director of the Mental Health Center, and I'd like to invite you all to the coffee hour after Mass this morning because the Mental Health Center is hosting, and we'd love to see you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Pat Hart, and as most of you know, Myra is going to be ordained a priest on January 28th. Spiritus Christi Church. Parking will be available in surrounding lots, and so make sure you get there early enough. We should have plenty of parking. Immediately following the ordination, there will be a luncheon at the Riverside Convention Center. Tickets for the luncheon are $25. You have a choice of chicken or vegetarian meal, and the vegetarian is gluten-free. We will be selling tickets today at both exits and also next week at all of the services. In addition, you may buy tickets uh, at the office. So thank you and hope to see you all there. Thank you, God, for this time together with you. Thank you for great music, your beautiful message. Thank you for being the guiding star in our lives. Thank you for the many callings, vocations, and destinies you've prepared for us to impact our universe. We ask that you send us forth today to be led and guided by you to fulfill each one of them, that we might reveal your deepest love and bring healing to our world this week. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. May our God bless us in the name of our loving God, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our celebration is ended. Let's go in love and peace to serve our God. Our closing song is, O Lord, 